I was born too late to see most of the Elkos that roamed America and the Northeast in particular, like the Delaware and Hudson's gorgeous blue and silver PAs that led the Adirondack and its dome cars through New England and down to Grand Central, or the San Joaquin Daylight on the other side of town. Both were sights to behold that not even the new turbo train could compete with, if I could remember any of them. Ultimately, around 297 Alco PA and B units were constructed between June 1946 and May 1953, while EMD's post-war passenger unit sales totaled about 1,111 and continued until 1963. And while the PAs were good-looking, photogenic, and above all else, rare, which inspired a legion of rail fan loyalty, apparently the PA's virtues were not apparent to most railroad management because rail fans and motor power superintendents often have different criteria for what makes a great locomotive great. I've read that the Alco PAs were notorious for belching black smoke, but so were all Alcos. But why is that? I realize that they had some monster diesel motors inside, but why on earth so smoky? The simple, most direct, and easy to understand answer is turbo lag and it was the main reason for the smoke. Most early turbos were belt driven, so if you knocked the throttle right into the fourth or fifth notch, you were guaranteed to have belt slippage. Therefore the turbo doesn't accelerate as quickly as the engine itself, so it can't force enough air into the cylinder fast enough. Instead it ends up with a higher fuel to air ratio in the cylinder and with more fuel, more exhaust is created. However, most opted out for exhaust driven turbos due to the high maintenance, inefficiency, and belt slippage of the earlier belt driven turbos. Another interesting fact is that Alco PAs, at least the D&H ones, had three different prime movers in their lifetime. Built with the 16 cylinder 244, then rebuilt with the 16 cylinder 251C, and later had a 12 cylinder 251C installed. The Alcos of the day used one of two engines, the 244 and the 251 and both were turbocharged. In those days, fuel controls on diesels weren't as sophisticated as they became later, and even a few years after that. The only way to get a diesel to accelerate is to feed it more fuel. When you tried accelerating an Alco, the fuel mixture went way rich until the turbo, which was a big heavy puppy, came up to speed and started really pumping the air, which generally took a while. That rich mixture is what made the smoke and it was practically built into the early engines. On a side note, the EMD turbochargers were said to be a lot lighter. Another note about EMDs is that they had a little trick to avoid that turbo lag. They had the turbo set up so that it ran using the exhaust gases. If the engine is accelerating quickly, there is a gearbox connected at one end to the crankshaft and at the other end to a fluid coupling which spins the turbo faster than the exhaust gases under those conditions, but allows it to be driven by the exhaust otherwise. This little trick is the main reason most short lines and regionals of the day use non-turbocharged 567s. That little gearbox is a real maintenance hole when the locomotives are used in switching service. The roots blowers permit you to hear each cylinder fire, which is where that endearing EMD chant comes from. Or so I've been told.
Of course, the turbo lag wasn't exclusive to just Alco 244s and 251s. I'm told that the early GE FDLs had a similar problem, and it can even happen on luxury automobiles, although the smoke isn't quite as heavy. Alco's 244s, 251s, and GE's FDLs are all four-cycle engines. Fairbanks Morse opposed pistons and EMD's 567s, 645s, and 710s are two-cycle engines. Not real sure about the De La Verne, that's Baldwin Locomotive Works or Hamilton engines. EMD diesels being two-cycle required a roots blower to force air into the cylinders if they were not equipped with a turbocharger, hence the GP38 and SD38 diesel electrics that I'll be doing a video on very soon. Just a little commercial there for you. A turbocharger is a good way to get the extra horsepower out of a given design, but it's a high maintenance item, and this may be why EMD avoided turbochargers until the Union Pacific Railroad forced the issue back in the late 1950s. EMD also had a mechanical link to the turbo, which cut out when the turbo finally kicked in on its own, and this helped to limit the smoky problem. I read somewhere that the Indian licensee for Alco Diesels had developed a new turbocharger which supposedly reduced the smoking problem. Now can you imagine that? An Alco diesel that doesn't accelerate under a cloud of black smoke like its steam engines before them. Imagine that. Alco put out some really great visual designs for locomotives, but the mechanics came close to being junk if they weren't kept maintained. Where EMD was a low maintenance design, Alco was a high maintenance machine. It was a similar scenario for Baldwin, although I think that a lot of Baldwin's troubles came about by them building custom designs for specific railroads and failing to perfect a mainstream locomotive to appeal to all of the railroads. Whatever the case, by the time they got their acts together, it was too late since the railroads didn't want to take another chance on either of them when they had their reliable EMDs to fall back on. EMD was also said to have used a supercharger rather than a turbocharger on all 12-cylinder 567s up to 1,200 horsepower and 16-cylinder 567s up to 1,750 horsepower. After that, and on all 645s except the SW1500, they used turbos geared as mentioned before.
And in terms of a good product but bad factory support, the Fairbanks Morse Train Masters surely took that prize. The engine was unusual but very reliable and the things could pull like nothing else. But if something went wrong, you were pretty well on your own as the factory just couldn't, not wouldn't, they were certainly willing enough, but couldn't help out much. That's really where EMD gained its edge in the locomotive market and wound up on top of the diesel game. And it also didn't help Fairbanks Morse that the United States Navy took all of their opposed piston motors for subs and some other crafts. There's a rumor that up through the E6 diesels, EMD had put a traveling mechanic slash electrician on each train that had E units pulling them so that if something went down, they were there to make sure that it went back up again. If this rumor is true, they couldn't have done that without GM's money behind them. And as another side note, this time for the Fairbanks Morse, the Southern Pacific was ready to invest very heavily in Fairbanks Morse train masters, but they had a problem that literally deep sixed them. They were set to throw out burning chunks of carbon and still burning fuel, which is fine at sea, but not so much in the forest. The folks along the right of way were said not to be all too happy with having to put out all of those fires the train masters started. Finally, one of the counties flat out banned all Fairbanks Morse locomotives of all types from operating in that county. One final note about diesel locomotive combustion. The fuel on a diesel locomotive is under direct mechanical control via the injection system and the amount of injected fuel determines the amount of power that the engine produces, like we talked about earlier. On the compression stroke, the air is compressed, heating as it does so until well above ignition point of the injected fuel but kept dense by the heavy cylinder balls and piston crown. When the fuel is injected, it lights off spontaneously in the hot air and is intended to burn completely in an excess of oxygen. Are you confused, Jet? For Trains 21, call me, AC.